Hello, hello, hello. I wonder if I can. Let's see if I can come. Hi, please log in, share, tag, and invite someone to join us. I'm going to... Share this. No, I don't want to do that. Hi. Hey, Tom. How are you? Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Does my heart good. My BT2 fam. That is so cool. So I'm going to start here in just a second. Um, I need to share this. We're going to come from uh, Zephaniah tonight. And uh, please tag, share, and invite someone to join us. Um, we're teaching from a series um, regarding intercessors and um, being an intercessor. Basically, what does it mean to pray? And there are people called to intercessory prayer, and but everybody is called to pray. God requires that everyone prays. So you do not have to necessarily be um, an intercessor in the kingdom. But we are all called to pray. So we are going to continue with that study. I thank God for my pastor who allowed me to share last week. And we're going to continue on. Last week we talked about Joel, the prophet, the minor prophet, Joel. And we're going to continue with another minor prophet. Uh, hello, Felicia. How are you? We're going to continue with another prophet, um, prophet Zephaniah. Now, the thing about, you know, minor prophets and major prophets, I talked about this last week. It's simply that their books were longer. That's it. Uh, a, a major prophet, his books, the book of the Bible um, is longer. And that's what makes him a major prophet. And a minor prophet, his book of the Bible is shorter. So that's what makes him a, um, a minor prophet. So we are going to get started. Um, let me pray. I'm trying to um, share this to my page as well. So God, I just thank you for those who are logging in, those who are listening, those who are tagging, those who are sharing. Father, I pray this word falls upon good ground. I call everyone's ears and hearts and souls good ground to receive today. And so, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Your word is life. It is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It is our guide. And so, Father, I pray that if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that does not know you as Savior and Lord and the love of your sacrifice for giving your life, God, I pray that they hear something in this teaching that lets them know you are there for them. You are with them. You have promised to never leave them, never forget about them. So, God, I just pray. I pray that this is a word that goes beyond today, but it just sits uh, in their spirit and they just chew on it until the next time we meet. So, Daddy, I just thank you for this opportunity and I love you and I appreciate you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All righty. So, Zephaniah. Zephaniah, do I want to, let's do it like this. Um, yeah. So Zephaniah was, again, a minor prophet. He um, was a prophet who was also during the time of Joel and Jeremiah. So many times when you read about Zephaniah, you will come across things that um, relate to Jeremiah or relate to Joel. So they are all um, prophets of that same time. So what 
did his name mean? I think it's always important to identify what different people's names mean in the Bible. And sometimes it sets you up for an understanding of why did they write the way that they wrote with the way that they wrote. So Zephaniah's name literally means God has hidden it or it means God lies wait like he's waiting to do something. Now, when you consider that there, there are scriptures that talks about Jesus waits to come back. He waits to return uh, to us from heaven to receive those who believe. So when you think about God lies in wait, what is he lying in wait for? That's almost like a lion, right? In the jungle, he's lying in wait. But God isn't lying in wait to punish you. God is not lying in wait to pounce on you. He's really lying in wait. The Bible says that Jesus waits. Hey, Ivory. Hey, Alberta. God waits. Uh, he gives us time to come into the knowledge and truth of Jesus Christ. So he's lying in wait. He's lying, waiting, hoping that someone would turn and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I, I, I've taken the wrong path. God, receive me back in. And he's a loving God. And the Bible says that he's patient and he's just. And he's waiting for us to return to him. And for those who don't know him, right, to turn all together and come to him. So his name, Zephaniah, his name literally means God has hidden. What is God hidden? God has hidden truths from uh, us. He's hidden truths from, uh, the Bible says, to those who don't believe because lest they knew them, they would, um, I'm paraphrasing, they would misuse these truths. And so there are things that he's hidden for just think about it. There are things you, you will go and ask your mom or your dad and they're like, you're too young to know that. You, you, you're too young to understand that. So they don't share everything with you as a child. You don't share everything with your children as a child. There are things you wait for them to come into maturity and to come into an understanding so that they can better comprehend what's going on, what you're talking about. So that's literally what Zephaniah's name means. And please tag, share, and invite someone to join us. I believe this word is going to bless us. And the thing about him uh, lying and in wait, lying in wait, or God has hidden, when you go through the book of Zephaniah, he's constantly warning the people. The whole book is about warning the children of Israel, warning uh, the those in uh, Jerusalem. Hey, don't do this. Don't do that. God is saying, God is saying. So God is even hiding his anger. He's hiding his just uh, punishment for the things that they just keep doing. You know, I often say that we pimp God. I know y'all ain't ready for that word, but we pimp God. We keep testing God. We keep pushing the boundaries thinking, oh, you know, God is okay with what we be. He might be okay with what we're doing, but in that process, he wants us to turn to him and find him and come back to him. Now, what's interesting is that my computer just did something weird, so I hope you all could see me. I know you could hear me, but I'm not sure if you could see me. So, he's hiding sometimes even his anger. He's never hiding his love, though. He's never hiding his grace. He's never hiding his patience from us. My God, if he withhold his patience and hid his patience and his love, what would we do? My God, I know so many of us thinking that we're doing this thing in the earth all by ourselves. No, you're not. No, you're not. Let me help you. Because some many of us years ago as a child, we grew up in church or we were taking the church at least, right? And we may have confessed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, but you may say, I'm not walking with him now. God ain't tripping on that. If you ever once said that, Lord, I believe you lived. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you, bear, you were buried. I believe you rose. That's all he cares about. And I know you may be like, well, I don't go to church anymore. I, I don't pray like I should. I don't read my word like I should. But if you ever confessed, Jesus is your big brother and God is your God and he's your heavenly father. And all he's waiting for is for you to come back into fellowship with him. And you have the relationship, right? Because he's your heavenly father and Jesus is your brother. And somewhere along the line, you made a confession. All he's desiring is that you come back into fellowship. 
If you have a wife, give me give me a thumbs up. If you have a husband, give me a thumbs up. You got kids or you or they didn't walk away from you. They left the house. I don't want nothing else to do with you, mama. Y'all be tripping, daddy. Y'all too strict. Okay. But when they need something, they coming back. Or maybe they're just coming back because they figured out, you know what? I want to be in relationship with my mom. I want to be in relationship with my dad. I want to I want to have fellowship with them. That's the same thing. That we get to do with God. We get that opportunity to just turn back and come back. And he, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive you. My God, that's just good news. See, now those of you who have never heard me teach, I get really excited about the word of God. So, amen. I might go off script sometimes. So, follow me. Please tag, share, and invite someone. Uh, Zephaniah's whole uh, assignment in his book was to proclaim and declare the pending and divine judgment of God. Now, what's interesting, someone could say, well, the whole book, yeah, the whole book was for that purpose because he kept trying to tell them, listen, get it together, do this, do that. God really doesn't want to punish you. I said this last week because that was kind of Joel's message too. God really, hey, Sister Parnes, God and Sister Malone, God does not want to punish you. He really doesn't. He's a loving father. The Bible says, what natural father, what earthly father who knows how to give good gifts would withhold from them and give them rocks, right? So what more would your heavenly father do who put you in this earth with purpose, who sent his son and his son, Jesus said, I'll go, I'll die on the cross for them. I'll take the 39 stripes. I'll, I'll take the piercing in the side. I'll take the nails in my feet, the nails in my hand and the thorn of, of uh, the crown of thorns on my head. I'll take all of that because I love them. I love them and I want them to have eternal life with me. So what more of a heavenly father who loves you and allowed you to come into this earth and into this world doesn't want to have fellowship with you. He wants to. He doesn't want to punish you. How many, I said this last week, how many of your parents ever said, this hurts me more than it hurts you when they had to give you a whooping? And you're like, I don't think so. <laughs> but that's because they love you. They really don't want to punish you. But Zephaniah's whole assignment for his book was to warn the people and to warn them, get it together. God really does not want to punish you. And so he would continue on through chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And I think it's only three chapters, if, if my memory serves me correctly. It's only three chapters in Zephaniah. So it, it's not a long book. But in those three chapters, that is, the, that is what he is warning the people of. He's warning them of this punishment or this judgment that was going to come from God. But if you get it right, if you say, okay, Lord, forgive me, I just keep messing up. Am I the only one that just kept messing up? right? And God you kept coming back to God, Lord, forgive me. I did it again. Lord, please forgive me. I'm sorry. And then at some point, I know how the devil works. He'll start to tell you, don't, don't keep coming saying you're sorry because you know you're not going to change. You know you're going to keep doing that. No, no, no. You keep coming to God because God wants you to keep coming to him. He's a loving father. Do you want your natural children to just stop coming to you because they've made so many mistakes? And sometimes that's exactly what happens. Because guilt and shame tries to lock us in and, and hold us down and say, nope. I'm not going to keep coming to God. I'm not going to say anything to that person. I'm not going to confess it to that person. No. And, and this is the thing about confession. Confess your faults one to another. You got to know who to confess to. You just can't confess to folk that ain't got no grace. You can't confess to people that don't, you know, they, they ready to pounce on you doing something wrong. No, those are not the people that you want to come to, right? So uh, again, tag, share, and invite someone. So Zephaniah, that was his assignment. And his message was always about the day of the Lord. He talked so much about the day of the Lord. So what was the day of the Lord? Now, what I want you to pay attention to, there are different ways that Lord is uh, written in the word. 
One is capital L, lowercase o, lowercase r, lowercase d. The other one is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And when you look at that word, they, 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 both of them identify the sovereignty of God, right? And his authority, his rule, his position. But when you kind of do it like this, this is how I always remember it. Capital, all capitals is more representing of God himself. Capital L-O-R-D is more representative of Jesus. So that's how I kind of always remembered them. So when you look at capital, all caps, it is God, Jehovah, God, the great I am, God, Yahweh. It is the sovereign rule and reign of God himself, God as God, the great I am. Lowercase is more, capital L and the rest lowercase, is recognizing he is sovereign. Not only is God sovereign, but Jesus as God is sovereign. He is master. He is Lord. He is strength. He is powerful. So when you see uh, the day of the Lord, the year of the Lord, uh, notice how it's spelled. In the original, it's all caps. But a lot of times in translation, they would do capital L, cap, lowercase o, lowercase r, lowercase d. But in its original, it was all caps. So it was talking about the day of the Lord, the day that God himself says, that's enough. The day of the Lord with Noah, when he sent the flood, the, the rain that came down from 40 days and the rain that came up from the earth and flooded the earth. And that was the day of the Lord, capital all caps Lord. So that day in the Old Testament always represented judgment. Now I know you're saying, why is this the day, uh, this Tuesday, that you uh, had me get on here? Because there's hope in this. There's hope in it. Oh my God, there's so much hope, right? And so that day, the day of the Lord always represented God's judgment, but it was God's judgment that was constantly giving the children, the people, his people, opportunity to turn back to him. He was constantly giving them opportunity to turn back to him. Please tag, share, and invite someone to join us. When we talked about this last week, we talked about how God would send the judge, then he would send the prophet. He would give him time with the judge to get it together. Then he would send the prophet, then the judge. And he was constantly like, warn them, tell them, warn them, tell them, now judge them, warn them. And if they would just get it together, I would stop having to do this, right? So it isn't that God is bipolar or schizophrenic, and I'm not making fun of either of those, either of those diagnoses or, or mental uh, things that are unhealthy in people. But a lot of times people will be like, well, why was God constantly going back and forth? No, he was going back and forth because he loves the people. Because he loves you and he loves me and he wants to give us a chance to get it together. And he keeps giving us a chance. Some people say he's the God of the third, fourth, fifth, six hundredth chance, right? Thank God. At least I need a good two, four, five, okay? So we thank God that he is a God of chances. So Zephaniah. Malachi says it like this. He says, before the coming of the great day of dread of the Lord, that day of judgment, I already said, God really doesn't want to punish his people. He doesn't. Matter of fact, he doesn't even want to punish the sinner. He doesn't want to punish the person who hasn't called upon the name of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He really doesn't. That's why the Bible says that Jesus waits he waits for all to come into the knowledge and truth of who he is, that I gave my life for you. I love you so much that I said, I'll go. I'll go for Sarah. I'll go for Pamela. I'll go for Phyllis. I'll go for Yvette. I'll go for Tanya. I'll go for Tom. If it was just you, he would have come. I'll go for Tuesday. Tuesday know how raggedy Tuesday was. And on a good day, I still might be tempted to be raggedy. Don't play you too, okay? All right, so he knows and he comes and he waits for you. Remember, Zephaniah's name literally means lies in wait. God lies waiting for you. And so 
Does that mean that when uh, Malachi or the day of the Lord is being discussed, that they are talking about immediately? No, he's not. But what he is saying is that, remember um, John the Apostle said, like in, in 1 John 1 or something like that, he said, it goes something like this. He says, uh, um, the reckoning has already begun. The reckoning has all, the moment Jesus Christ left this earth, the end times was starting. I know, you know, and, and your grandparents probably said it and your great grandparents probably said it and Jesus is soon coming. But this we know he is closer to coming now than he was with our grandparents or our great grandparents. Because that day of the Lord started when Jesus left. OK, so then it goes on to say also another. So one was first John uh, chapter two, where it calls the the the, uh, the reckoning has begun. Another one is in Romans chapter 13. And it says, knowing the time that now it is a uh, high time to awake from your sleep for our salvation is nearer than when we first began. I confess Jesus Christ as at 13, 14. So what would that be? Um. 39 years ago, something like that, 40, 40, 39, 40 years ago. So God, Jesus is closer to returning than when I first confessed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now, I get happy about that. I pray that myself and my family and those I love are rapture ready because I want to see everybody that I'm in relationship with when I get to heaven. That's why I will jokingly say when I when things happen, like I'm still saying I'm going to heaven just because I might have had a bad day or I, I clocked on somebody. Come on. I ain't the only one. I'm still saved. All right. Just because you have a Sunday that you say, I don't feel like going to church. I'm gonna watch online. You still saved. OK, we're still saved, even though you can't go into four walls and worship Inside of a church, you're still saved. If you confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, I believe he lived, died, was buried, rose, and is coming back, you're saved. You're a believer. That's it. That's all it takes. It doesn't take any rituals or traditions. And I understand that's why so many people do not want... They, they say um, legalized religion or organized, um, organized religion or organized assembly, but your job is organized assembly. Did you realize that? And your job ain't got a heaven or a hell or eternal life to put you in. Your fraternity, your sorority, all of those things are organized assemblies. When you go to a basketball game, a football game, it's organized assembly. It's just that nobody's necessarily talking about God. Maybe they pray, maybe they do the Pledge of Allegiance or the Star Spangled Banner. But all of those things were written in some context with God in mind. So whether we know it or not, we're always, often, I won't say always, we're participating in organized assembly. And God just hopes that in some of that somewhere he's being thought of because you have a relationship with him. And if nothing else, because you have a relationship with him, you show up in that space. And you bring God. Isn't that something? You get the honor. You get to do that. That's such such an honor. It is such an honor. And so he says, he says in First Peter, First Peter chapter four, he said, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and be watchful. Like, is it in my hand right now? No, but it's at hand, which means it's coming. It's coming. And all God wants, since he was a part of your creation. He set that thing up so your mom and dad could get together and your dad's seed could connect with your mom's egg and your mom could carry you and, and bring you into this world. And I know in some people's situations, that wasn't always a good thing. Maybe your upbringing wasn't. But understand, you being here is because God has a purpose for you and he loves you and he needs for you to come to him and understand what is my purpose? Why am I in the earth? That's all he wants. If you ask, he's going to show you. So Zephaniah, even though this book is all about judgment, but it's really about calling the people. Joel was about calling people to repentance. Zephaniah is about judgment because they didn't get it. <laughs> they didn't get it. Hey, Gladys. Hey, Mildred. They didn't get it. And so he's like, okay, 
Now here I am. I'm this prophet that's showing up because y'all didn't get it. So here I go again. I'm telling you what the Lord is going to do. Now, what we have to understand when the Bible talks about it's at hand, the dreaded day, the end is at hand, all of those different things. That's God's timing. That's not our timing. That's not a chronological chronos, tick, tick, tick of a clock, you know, uh, 12, 12 o'clock hand, 12 o'clock six o'clock, nine and three. That's not it. It's God's time. Because the Bible says that no one knows the day or the hour of when God, Jesus is going to return. No one knows. The angels don't even know. I don't even believe scripture dictates that Jesus knows. God's just going to say, go. It's time. And he always be ready, right? And so when we understand that, um, he was constantly telling the people, get it together. So I'm not going to read, like I said, it's three short chapters, read them. But I want to read uh, chapter one, verse 14, a little bit of chapter two and a little bit of chapter three to kind of put all of this in context. So chapter one, verse 14 says, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and it is coming quickly. Now, remember, this is not our near, like it's nearly uh 730. It's not that near because the you remember the scripture reminds us that a day is like a thousand and a thousand days is like one one day. Um in uh Luke chapter four. Um I think it's Luke chapter four. Is that right, Holy Spirit? Mm. Peter, second Peter chapter three. That the the a day, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So I don't want you to get caught up in our time. This is God's timing. So that's what he says in chapter one, verse 14. Chapter two, he says it like this, and starting in verse one. He said, Gather together, gather yourselves together. You shameful nation. He said, before the decree takes effect and the day passes like the wind blown shaft before the Lord's fierce anger. Now, remember, he's been constantly warning them. So don't think he just sent Zephaniah on the scene and was like, get him. Tell him I'm coming. Come on. How many times did you, your mama tell you stop climbing on that bed and jumping before you jump and bust your head? Stop climbing on top of that dresser. Stop jumping off of that. And the very thing they said was going to happen is what happened. It was the same thing with God. And it's the same thing for you. And it's the same thing for me. Amen. And so he goes on to say, this is where it gets really good. Remember he said, gather together, gather yourselves together. He said, do this before the decree of the Lord comes. He said, do this before God's fierce anger is turned towards you. He said, do this before the day of the Lord comes upon you. He said, do this. Hear me. This is, this is where those chances come in. He said, do this and seek the Lord. All those who are humble, all those who recognize, you know what? I ain't altogether lovely. I got some stuff I need to work on. I need to learn how to trust God. I need to learn how to forgive people. I need to learn how to trust myself. I need to know that when God created me, he put a purpose in me and I need to get busy living it out. He, he, he's saying, hey, hey, listen, seek the Lord, all the humble. He said, and do what I command. Just, just do what I ask you to do. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Just, just do what I ask you to do. Stop go gossiping and keep coarse joking out your mouth. Just, just do some things I ask you to do. He said, do that. He said, that's all I'm asking you to do. He goes on and say, seek righteousness, not perfection. Because you can't be per perfect. There's only one perfect person, and that was Jesus in the earth. He's not looking for you to be perfect. The Bible says... I am, because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, I am the righteousness of God. Not because I'm always right, but because right is in me. <laughs> and that's Jesus. Right is in me, and that's God. And I am the righteousness of God in and through Christ Jesus. And so are you. And so you can be. He, he died for that. 
It's not about you being right. It's not about you always being right. It's not about you always making the best and right decisions. It's not about you being perfect. It's none of that. It's about you saying, God, I know you're right. And if I just stay connected to you and I stay close to you, I might have some chances of being right too. And you're, you're coming back for the righteous. Those who are trying and seeking to do the right thing according to his word. And if you fail, the Bible says if you miss it, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Oh my, I can't beat that. I can't beat that and neither can you. So he says, he says, seek humility. Just admit you wrong. Just admit you wrong. You know, the world does not revolve around me. The world does not revolve around you. Just admit that. It's not, it's really not your way or the highway. It's really not because the truth is you ain't got no highway. So your way or the highway. So you got to get on somebody's highway. It ain't even yours. So why, why you, everything got to be about you? No, it doesn't. Humble yourself. When we miss it, Lord, forgive me, I miss it. When you miss it with your spouse, you know what, babe? I'm sorry. Husband or wife, your kids, you know what? Dad didn't approach that the right way. You know, let, can you give dad some grace? Mommy didn't. Can you give me some grace? Teach your children how to extend grace. Because guess what? That's what God does for us. And when they see you doing it, they'll be like, oh, that's what it looks like. When they see you forgiving, that's what it looks like. When, it see, when they see you being flexible and cooperative, they learn, oh, that's what it looks like. When they see how you treat their mom and how you uh, engage with their dad, oh, that's what it looks like. Okay, I can have healthy relationships. It all starts with relationship. And it's relationship with Jesus Christ. Someone asked me the other day, they were just talking about religion. And I said, I don't do religion. They're like, but you're a Christian. I know, but I don't do religion. I don't religiously do anything because I'm a Christian. I do it because I'm in relationship. I choose to serve God. I desire to serve God. I take joy in serving God. I love his word because I know his word is Jesus. And that is what gets me closer and closer to him and allows me to learn more and more about him. That's why I read his word. That's why I talk to him. Honey, I talk to him in the shower, in the car, washing dishes, laying in my bed. I'm constantly talking to him. Because the same way you engage God and commune with God and Jesus in fellowship. Hey, let me tell you, my pastor told me one time, my previous pastor, he said, the more intimate you are with God, the more intimate you are with your spouse and the more you desire to be intimate with people. So, for those of us who are single and we love Jesus, watch out there now. So here we go. He says, he says, seek the Lord. All you are who are humble. He said, seek righteousness, seek humility. He said, perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Now, I want you to rest that right there. Zephaniah says, perhaps if you gather together, he said, don't forsake the assembly of the brethren. I know we're not in the four walls right now, but we're gathering right here. You, you, you are gathering with me by receiving this teaching and being a part of this Bible study, right? When you go into someone else's Bible study online, you're gathering. When you're gathering in fellowship with friends and family, he said, gather together. He said, and do it before the decree comes. Do it before God gets angry. Do it before the wrath of God. And he said, and when you're together, Seek God. That's what we're doing right now. We're seeking understanding of God according to his word. You already in line with God. I tell people all the time, listen, how do you know you're in the will of God? When you ask God, what's your will? It ain't deep. It ain't deep. How do I know I'm in the will of God? Because I've asked God, what is his will? That's the first thing. How do I know how to obey God? You ask him, Lord, how to teach me how to obey you. Teach, the, teach me how to obey you. And he'll teach you. He'll show you. And your obedience and obeying God may look different than my obedience. And so don't expect your walk or your relationship with God to look like anybody else's. Because it probably won't. Because it's according to your personality. It's according to how God has made you. 
Your relationship with your spouse doesn't look like the relationship that somebody else has with their spouse. Your relationship with one child in your house does not look like the relationship that your other child has with you. And guess what? It's okay. It's okay. And so he says, seek the Lord. He said, and who knows? Who knows? That's the same thing Joel said last week. He said, perhaps you will be sheltered. If you do these things, who knows? If you do these things, perhaps God will not, his anger will not turn against you. His anger is only for a moment, the Bible says. It does not, his love is for a lifetime. His anger is for a moment, just like you with your children, just like you with your spouse, hopefully. <laughs> but he says, perhaps, who knows? You will be sheltered. You Listen, you will be hidden. What does Zephaniah's name mean? God is hidden. God says, if you do what I ask you to do, even when my wrath comes, my just punishment for others around you, my just punishment for, for pride and, and all of the things that are running rampant in this country right now, from the top to all the way to the, to the lowest form, he said, who knows? When I come, he said, me, who Zephaniah's name means God is hidden, and he's representing that in this book, God said, I'll hide you. I'll shelter you. From my own wrath. Y'all get, see, this is the stuff that makes me happy. Good God Almighty. This is the stuff that makes me happy. God is good. Listen, God says, I will be angry. Hey, Sans, he said, I will be angry, but I'm going to protect you from my own anger. My just punishment for stuff you've done. Y'all don't know when to shout. It should be some happy, smiling faces going up this time right here going up y'all should begin happy god said i will hide you from my wrath for stuff you deserve to be punished for do you understand that oh my god when i was a thief yeah i've said it i've written it in my books ain't no big deal when i was a thief <laughs> come on sans mail help somebody please tag share and invite someone God could have and should have let me get caught. And I know my mind wasn't healthy and I was battling with depression and Graves' disease and I wasn't healthy. I wasn't stable mentally. So I started doing things that was outside of who I was. But God could have let me get caught. But he protected me. He, he sheltered me. He covered me in the midst of my sin. Y'all don't know when to shout. He's protected you. You should have some diseases. You should still be on crack. You should still be an alcoholic. Your wife, your husband should have left you. Yes. But God, his grace, continue to cover you and say, no, I'm going to protect you from your own crazy self. I, and I'm going to protect you from me. Oh, somebody should just shout about the stuff that should have happened. Good God Almighty, the stuff that should have happened, the stuff that you deserve to happen to you, because I shout about that. Never mind the stuff I know about. Oh, God, what about the stuff he protected you from that you didn't even know was coming down your lane, was coming down your road? Oh, he kept you from that man. He kept you from that woman. You didn't know that he had HIV. You didn't know that she was crazy. She was a stalker. And he said, no, nah, don't, don't get her number. Good God Almighty. You didn't know that he was an abuser or a controlling man. You didn't know that. But God said, no, 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 no. Keep it moving. He protected you from that. Oh, you thought you wanted that job. You thought you needed that job. And God said, no, no, I'm not going to let you take that job. Because in three months, that company is going to close down. I'm not going to do that. You thought you were supposed to, to move to that city. And God said, no, I'm not going to let you move because the coronavirus is going to come. COVID is going to come. And you would have got to that city. And you would have been sheltered in. And you wouldn't have been able to go nowhere. <gasps> oh, God. You wouldn't have been able to enjoy nothing. Then you would have been down there miserable. But I, I didn't let you go. I didn't let you make the move yet. He's a gracious God. He's a loving God. And I don't think we give him 
as much credit for the things. Just, just give him some smiles and some, some happy faces and some thumbs up for the things he kept you from. So many times, Ivory, we know your story. You're a testimony. Brother Richard, he's kept you from some stuff. He said, who knows? Who knows? He said, perhaps, perhaps there's some things God has kept you from, from receiving that you deserve to be punished for, that you deserve to be caught in. But he said, no, I'm not going to let that happen to you because his grace, because he loves you. And, and listen, the Bible says that the, it, the sun shines on the just and the unjust, those who are believers and saved and those who are not. It, the rain falls upon those who are saved and those who are not. Some stuff you just get because he's your creator. He may not be your heavenly father. He may not be your God, but he's your creator. He's Jehovah, God, who has created all things. He is Elohim, who has created all. Sometimes you just get stuff because he breathed life into you. And you're protected from things because he's giving you time. Good God, Almighty. Jesus, he's giving you time to come into the kingdom. Hey, he's giving you time. He's giving you time. So what we must understand that just as sure as there are many people who receive what we would call blessings from God. Yeah, thank him, Sister Owens. Thank him. There's some things we receive as blessings from God. And we feel like, well, they're not even serving God. They don't even go to church. I don't even think they're a Christian. There's somebody that I could say that about right now. And they're in high position. I do not believe they're a Christian. There's nothing about anything they have said publicly. Matter of fact, they've said publicly, I've never asked for forgiveness for anything. So it is impossible to say that you're a Christian and you've never asked for forgiveness. Because a part of that is, Lord, forgive me for I've sinned against you. But yet... People feel like they're getting away with everything. How does he keep getting away with everything? But I'm here to tell you, he's not. He's not. Hey, Sister Janice, he's not getting away. God is keeping an account and it don't feel good to us. Why do these things keep happening? Why does God, God ain't doing it. God is allowing it. Why is God allowing it? I don't know. I've been asking him. For almost three years. Why do you keep... No, over three years. Why do you keep allowing these things? I don't know. But remember when Lazarus died? Remember when he died? And they sent word to Jesus that Lazarus had died. And the Bible says that he waited three days to go see about Lazarus. And by the fourth day, by the time he got there, Lazarus was long dead. And his sister said, by now he stinketh. Prima, why didn't you come when we called you? Because you could have raised him for the dead. He said, this was done for the glory of God. I know it don't feel good when you're watching it in the news and it's report after report. And I know it's weighing on you and I know it's frustrating and I know it can feel overwhelming and, and the economy and COVID and this and that. And they think they're getting away with it, but I'm telling you, they're not. They're not. Just like I didn't get away with stuff, you don't get away with stuff. The difference between you and me, I'll speak for myself, is that when I miss it, I'm coming to God saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that way. I want to show up in an environment bringing strength and bringing love and being a person that, that, that brings makes an impact and has a positive influence wherever I go. I never want to come and, 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 and I bring a negative energy into a space. And if I do shift me, God, bring me back. Nobody's getting away with anything. He, they not getting away with it. I know it doesn't feel good, but I'm telling you, he says right here, he says, listen, you must understand, beloved, there are Christians, there are people who have called upon the name of the Lord that will not escape God's punishment on this side of heaven or the other side of heaven. 
Because the Bible says we have to answer for every deed done in this body. And that's why you need to get to repenting now. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. I told you last week, the Lord started speaking to me about pride. That he was coming after pride. And that's pride at every level. He's coming after pride. And let me let me tell you how profound that is in just a second. Now, mind you, I told you God gave me that word back in May or June about pride. It is pride why people don't want to put their mask on. That's pride. Because you don't want nobody telling you what to do. Because you, you think you know everything. You don't know nothing. You don't know nothing. You definitely don't know more than God. And if that's the law, if you're being asked to do that, is it going to kill you? To just put on a mask in a store, in a building. But it's pride. And God hates pride. Pride is why Lucifer fell from heaven. Because it was all about I. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Okay? I'm going to be like God. No, you're not. You ain't going to never be like God. Sorry. <laughs> and God said he's dealing with pride. So even if you don't think you have pride in you or you're a prideful person, just Lord, examine my heart. If there's anything in me that is not like you, take it out. God, I don't want to be pride. I don't want anything to do with pride. Pride is ugly because eventually pride becomes arrogance and arrogance looks is haughty and it's mean and it's bullying. We don't want anything to do with that. You being confident about who you are and, and who you are in Christ and what you believe, that's not, that's not pride. You might take pride in your relationship and take pride in, in maybe knowing what you know, but you don't have to be prideful, full of pride. Make room to grow and to receive knowledge from other people. And if you choose to agree, to disagree, that's cool. That's what you believe. That's what I believe. That's what you think. That's what I think. But I'm good and we good and we don't have to walk around and be mad at each other. That's the whole thing with racism. You, you, you don't like me. You don't like somebody because they don't look like you. Sexism, racism, ageism, classism, all them isms. Get rid of them. Because it's simply because there's something about someone else that you don't like because they're not like you. That's pride. And it's, it's masked and it's hidden in a thing called isms. But it's pride and God hates pride. Ah, help me, Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sands. So he said, God is giving chance to everybody. He's giving chance. Listen, when he gives a Christian, a, a believer in Jesus Christ, another chance, that chance is for us to repent, to change our mind about the thing that we're doing and turn Turn from that and return back to him. He gives the unbeliever a chance to repent, change your mind about who God is and what Jesus did for you on the cross. Turn and come to him. You're not coming back to him. You're coming to him. But he gives everybody a chance. He gives everybody chances and chances and chances because that's the kind of God he is. That's the heavenly father that we serve. And throughout the book, again, he's constantly urging them to repent, giving them an urgency. Do it. Confess Jesus Christ. It, well, not Jesus Christ. In this case, Old Testament. Come to God. Return to God. I would say to you today, what's the, what's honestly, what, what can you lose trying Jesus? Tell me. Somebody put it in the comments. What do you lose by giving Jesus a chance? What do you lose by giving salvation a chance? What, can, what do you lose? There's plenty that you can gain. He said he loads you up with the benefits. He's, I know you're saying, I'm about, I was about to say he's a healer. He's a provider. And somebody could say, well, I tried Jesus and my mama didn't get healed. I understand that. My father still died. My child still died. I get that. Something bad still happened. I totally understand. <laughs> I love you. I love you, Tom. Yeah, not a dang on thing, okay? You lose nothing. And so I know that. I understand there are people who became atheists and agnostics because 
Why did that happen? Why did that happen to my people if you're a Jew? Or why did that happen um, to uh, my people if you're African? Or why did that happen to my people if you're Hispanic or of, of Latin origin? Why did that happen? So, so I don't want nothing to do with God. Why does this keep happening to black men if God is real? Why does this keep happening that policemen are getting shot now? Where is God? God is in the same place he was before all of these things started happening. He's still on the throne. Why does he allow certain things to happen? I don't know. But he's still God and he still loves you. And he still sent his son to die for your sins. You lose nothing like Tom says. Not one dang on thing. You lose nothing by giving him a chance. Some things in this relationship with God will happen immediately. And other things will take time as you walk out your salvation. But give him a try. Why not? I know somebody else said, what would you lose? You can't, you, ain't, you won't lose nothing by voting for me or something. But he ain't God. I'm talking about God. You really won't lose anything <laughs> by choosing Jesus. And so we got about 10 minutes and I want to get through this, uh, this, this study. So chapter three, this is, remember I said at every level, God is dealing with pride. Remember I said, God gave me that word. And I've been sharing it with people that a woe is coming. He's dealing with pride at every level. Individually, corporately, leaders, uh, 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 government, president, everything up and everything down. He's dealing with pride. He's coming after it. And this is why you have to ask God to examine your heart. And to show you you before somebody else got to show you you. So chapter three, this is what's key. Hey, Angela, this is what's key. He says, there are four classes of leadership, listen, that God singled out for their condemnation. Four in chapter three. The princes, <coughs> those who are royal and of noble and high position. Uh, he looked at judges. Now, what's going on right now? Somebody tell me. They trying to hurry up. And put somebody in this position at the highest federal court level. I'm not here to do politics, but you better understand what that means if that happens. Nothing, no scale, no scale. I don't care if you're cooking in your kitchen. No scale should be weighed in one direction in one party or another. It should not. Because then it becomes imbalanced, unbalanced, and unfair. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. These two weeks that pastor has allowed me to teach this Bible study, one was Joel and now Zephaniah, nothing is by coincidence because this is the word of the Lord. He's coming after pride. You need to check your pride at the door. You don't know nothing. What did I tell you my spiritual mom told me? And what you know, Tuesday can fit in a thimble and there would still be room at the top. Compared to God, we don't know nothing. And quite honestly, probably compared to the person we sit next to. We don't know nothing. That's why you need the body. That's why you need people. So we can grow up together and mature. So he said, listen, I'm dealing with the leadership of princes. Those in royal, noble, high positions. They keep talking about they've been nominated twice for the Nobel Peace Prize. People don't understand. Don't listen. Don't, don't, don't help. I'm about to help somebody right now. Don't chase after high positions because you prideful. You arrogant. You're narcissistic. You think it's all about you. Don't chase after those positions, boo-boo, because the fall coming down is higher and it's going to hurt. It's higher and it's harder when you come down. Don't seek after those seats. If God lifts you up, let him lift you up, but not because it's what you want. And, you, and really what you want ain't got nothing to do with God. It ain't got nothing to do with advancing his kingdom. It got to do with your pockets, your position, your person. And those people who are like you. Oh my God, I, I need somebody to hear me. Don't, don't want for a position and desire such royal and high positions and noble positions. In high seats, wanting to go to a place that uh, your maybe your gifts 
are taking you or your talents or your abilities or your uh, gift of gab or your ability to fake the funk. But your character can't keep you there, oh God. Don't desire it. That's why now, before God elevates you, start saying, God, check me. Show me. Absolutely. Greed and pride. Absolutely. And all those other things that are the seven deadly sins that God hates. <coughs> oh my. So he said, princes and judges. He said, and I'm coming after spiritual leaders. Prophets and priests. Because you have not called the people out on their mess. All of y'all who ain't calling him out, all of y'all who see what's going on around you, whether it's at your level or at higher levels, and you ain't saying nothing, the word says God is coming after you. Mm-hmm. He said, priests. He said, because you are unfaithful to the Lord. Priests and prophets. <clears throat> judges and princes, people who sit in high noble positions. He said, you're unfaithful to me. You don't do what I ask you to do. You don't say what I tell you to say. You don't go where I tell you to go. I can't get you to get up and pray. I, when was, I can't get you to forgive. I can't get you to tell that person, you know what, I love you, but I don't agree with that. And that's okay. I love you, but what you're doing right here, you say you love God, this is against God's word. My God, my God, thank you, Sister uh, 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 Sands. He says, <coughs> he goes on in chapter three, he says, have you not seen? Have you not read? Have you not been told what I have done when people keep trying me? Oh my, how many of us have said, don't try me? Don't try me. Do not try me. I'm not her. <laughs> I'm not him. You really don't want to try me. I might wear five inch heels and have my face done and the do is tight. And sometimes I got my nails on and my toes did and dressed to the night. But don't try me. I know how to put Vaseline on and get in there and get something done. Don't try me. What they say, if I didn't call, if I didn't ask for you, don't come. Don't try me. That's what God is saying. That's what God is saying. Haven't you heard what I've done? See, this is part of the problem, beloved. We haven't seen God walk up in the church, walk up in a building, and just lay people out. We ain't seen him just, just do stuff and be like, enough. I'm just sick of this. Y'all saying, y'all sick of what's going on in the land. Do you think God ain't sick of it? But he's giving. He's laying. He lies and wait. He's waiting. For you, me, them to just say, okay, God, forgive me. Forgive me. I have done this the wrong way for, for three years, for going on four years, for 50 years, for 40 years, for 20 years. I just, I, forgive me. I, I want to do it your way. That's all he's wanting. That's all he's wanting, beloved. He says, I thought, this is what he says. This is what he says in, in about verse seven. He said, I thought, surely... You would fear me now. I thought surely you would, you, would, you, you, you would fear me. And you would stop doing that. And you would stop treating people that way. And you would stop saying the crazy stuff you're saying. And you would stop going where you're going and doing surely. Now let me say this. I've said this for years. When people say to me, Minister Tate, Prophetess, I'm, I'm just... You know, I'm struggling and I know it's wrong and I don't want to do it. I, I'm so happy you're struggling. People have looked at me like y'all probably like, what? Yeah, I'm glad you're struggling. Because struggling means you have not turned yourself over totally, allowed yourself to just go all the way in that thing. And nor has God turned you over. That's good. He's still coming after you. He's still saying, listen, listen, Natalie, I got a purpose for you. Wanda, it's still some stuff I need for you to do. Tom, I got something I need for you to do, so I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep beckoning you, Ivory. I'm going to keep coming after you, Angela. I'm going to keep coming. I didn't send my son to die for you not to fulfill your purpose. I didn't send my son for you to die to, to, to live a lowly life. 
I need you to live up to the greatness that's in you. I need for you to walk in the vision and the purpose I put you in the earth to fulfill. Somebody is waiting on you. So he will keep drawing you. He will keep wooing you. He will keep coming after you because he loves you. Yeah, yeah. Just like the prodigal son and the father was out there every day waiting on his child to come back. And one day, here he comes. And he goes and gets the robe and the ring and he throws the feast. That's your God. That's what he does for you. So, but he says here, I thought surely, after I just told you if you do those little things that... I would protect you from me and from yourself, but you still pimping me? You still going to keep trying me? Tuesday, are you really going to keep trying me, saith the Lord? Are you really going to? I'm just putting myself in it. I, I can do that because I know, right? We all got something. I told y'all that when we first started. Didn't I tell you that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, you just will not accept my correction. You will just you will you just won't do these simple things I've asked you to do. He says so. He said, You are eager. This is what he says in verse 8, chapter 3, Zephaniah. He said, You are eager to keep acting corruptly. Who does that sound like? You are eager to keep doing wrong. You are eager to keep lying. You are eager to quit to continue to push the envelope. He said, You're eager. You're eager to do it. You get up like, what can I do today? That's what it looks like. You, you ain't in no way, if you eager to do anything that's wrong, you are definitely not eager to do anything that's right. You're not even trying. He said, okay, so this is what God says in verse uh, 9. He says, okay, here we go. He said, wait for me. He said, wait for me. He said, a day is going to come that I, God, will stand and testify he said, keep, keep playing with me. That's what he said. That's, that's, the, that's the Tuesday take translation. He said, keep playing. He said, just wait. He said, just wait. He said, declares the Lord. That's what the word says. He said, for the day, there will be a day that I will stand up and testify again. Remember, it, it's not our time. It's not <coughs> what we know as chronological time. He said, I'm going to stand up and testify. What does that mean? God says, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to rise up to plunder. I'm going because I'm tired of you because I've given you chance after. But I love you. I still love you. You 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 get sick of your kids, don't you? I, I am tired of you. Keep getting the crash in the car. That's it. I'm taking the car. But dad, that's my car. I pay the bill. I pay the note. I pay the insurance. Give me the keys. I'm taking it. I am tired of you continuing to dishonor our marriage. Give me my ring. <laughs> I'm back. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm taking the house. I'm taking the cars. Good God Almighty. That's what plunder means. It's a violent take. It's a violent taking away. It's a violent stripping. Because at that point, I'm up here. My hand is out of the camera. I am fed up. That is not what God wants to do. He is patient and just, I told you, to forgive us. The Bible says he rises to show compassion. So not only does he rise to show compassion because he loves us he, and, and we're doing what he asks us to do and he knows we're going to miss it. He knows we're going to miss it. He knows we're going to fail. He knows we're going to fall short. He ain't tripping on that because that means you win a season that you won raggedy and you won out of order. He knows that you're trying. So he rises to show compassion towards you. He gets up out of his seat. What is Tuesday doing? My God, what is Jamal doing? What is Natalie doing? What is Tom doing? What is Wanda doing? What is Tammy doing? Oh God, I need to rise. I need to rise for Angela. I need to rise for Ivy. I need to rise for Sarah and everybody else in this timeline watching, tag, share, and invite someone. We're almost done. But they can get it on the replay. Go ahead and tag them now. Go ahead and share now. He said he will rise. He said, but since you won't listen to me, since you just keep doing it, and you just, you just eager to do stuff that you ain't got no business. You just eager to see. Can I get away with it? Let me see. I'm going to do this too. Let me see. He said, okay. He said, so what's going to happen? He said, this is what's going to happen. 
You won't accept my correction? You, you won't do it? He said, I'm going to plunder your stuff. I'm going to forcibly take everything that you think is yours. Everything that you think you went and acquired on your own by your skill and your business deals and your acumen and your degrees and your talents and gifts that I gave you, talents I gave you, abilities I gave you, doors I opened, opportunities I sent your way. Since you think you did it, he said, I'm going to take it all back. I'm going to strip you naked because you won't listen. You're not even interested in obeying. Now, I choose to believe that everyone under the sound of my voice, that ain't you. Because the truth is, you wouldn't be listening and staying on here if you weren't trying. You might be like, man, I got to get this right. If nothing else, this word is bringing conviction. Like, I got to get that right. I need to get that right. And, and since God said he's, he's a very present help in the time of trouble, that he'll, he draws close to those who are a broken spirit and a contrite heart, those who are humble, those who are saying, Lord, I need your help. I posted the other day, there's a prayer, Jesus, help, amen. Three powerful words, but it's also a prayer. So I believe, just, just that's all he's requiring. But to those who ain't trying to do none of this, he said, I'm coming after your stuff. He said, I'm going to take everything you think you acquired according to your own ability and knowledge and fortitude and strength. He said, I'm taking it all. And you ain't getting it back. He said, and this is, this, this, this is what, you know, people say, <coughs> I'm waiting on God. I always tell people half the time you're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you. But this text right here, this is a waiting on God that ain't going to feel good. Good God almighty. This is a waiting on God that you don't want. That wait. Because the, the, I said this before. The last days are really, they began um, uh, when Jesus came, actually when he came into the earth, not just when he departed. When he was born into the earth, the last days began. Okay? So, <clears throat> they began at that point. And this whole thing about... Uh, he, remember when he came into the temple and he stood up and he read the scripture, Isaiah, and he said, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing because when he, when he arrived on the scene, it began the last day. He said, it's been fulfilled because I'm here. I'm here. I'm on the scene now. And so remember, I said, we're closer than we were. The Bible says than when we first accepted Christ, we're closer than we were when our mom and our grandparents were saying it. We're closer. We don't know the day or the hour. But when we start thinking of this day of Christ and the day of the Lord, the difference between the, the new, the Old Testament talked about the day of the Lord. The New Testament talks about the day of Christ. Why? Because Christ is the anointed one. Christ is the one, his anointing that comes to break the yoke and set us free. You do not, I do not have to be uh, bound to past hurts and past sins and past struggles. I said today, stop giving the devil your hands to beat you up. And stop giving him your mind to make you feel guilty. Take it back. He got too much real estate in your life and he ain't paying no rent. Put him out. Put his tail out. Literally. <laughs> Literally. So, God just simply wants us to say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And Jesus, I ask you to rule and reign over my life. I put this word out for every intercessor and prophet. Um, I even the other day just had to repent before God and was like, I have not been praying the way that I should. I have not been calling out to you the way that I should have. And, and whether you are a Christian, everyone is called to pray. We want things in this world to turn and to stop and to stop repeating themselves and to come out of this fog and all of the things that are going on, I talked to a young lady yesterday and, and just told her about what happened with the Kiana, uh, Kiana Taylor situation. And she just immediately started crying and boohooing. She was like, it's just too much. When is it going to be fair? You want, we, we, me and you, all of us want the, we got to pray. And you ain't got to spend hours in prayer. Lord, do something. Lord, show up. Lord, turn these things around. Lord, bring us to a place of humanity again. They don't have to be long, drawn-out prayers. You just talk to God according to your personality. He made you. 
He knows your voice. He knows how you talk. He's not tripping on that. But I had to repent. I had to say, Lord, forgive me. Because I have not been coming to you the way that I used to and the way that I know how. Where I see results. I see God doing it. And so I charge you today. As Zephaniah was crying out to the people to repent because judgment is coming. I'm crying out to you to ask you to examine your hearts. Ask God anything that's in me that is not like you, God, take it out. I want to be more like you. I want to serve you. I want to I want to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'm going to reward you with much on this side of heaven. And guess what? He wants to do that. He wants to reward you. He wants to bless you. I told you, he rises to show compassion towards you. He rises to show you love. And so, as we journey... <clears throat> In this season, the Bible also talks about not only uh, the day of the Lord and um, uh, the day of Christ. There's also something that the Bible talks about, which is the year of the Lord, the acceptable year of God, the year of the Lord's favor. And this is when the Bible talks about Jubilee, like when God starts to cancel dead and he's let things go. And <coughs> I want to speak this over your life. I want to speak that God's judgment for the pride, for the prideful and the greedy is not your portion. Because he told me that day, he said, those who are obeying me and seeking to do the right thing, he said, I'm going to cover them. I hadn't read this yet. I'm just now reading this. He said, I'm going to cover you. I'm going to cover all those who have called upon my name and are seeking to do the right thing. I'm speaking that over your life. That just because you have heard this message, you have made a decision to say, you know what? I'm going to ask God daily to examine my heart, to show me me. When I miss it, I'm going to ask God to forgive me. When I miss it with people, I'm going to try to go and I'm going to go make it right with them. If they receive me, great. If they don't, I can't fix that. But I know I've tried to do the right thing. And that's all God cares about. And so when we do that, I declare and decree because it is written over your life that the year of the Lord's favor will rest on you. I know 2020 is like somebody take this. Don't nobody want this year. But God still has a plan for you in this year. As a matter of fact, in the Jewish calendar, they, they were already, they're already in 2021. So you can claim 2021 if you want to and say, Ashes to ashes on 2020. But hear me. I speak God's loving proclamation and prophetic word over your life. If you are he or she who is saying, Lord, examine me. I want to be more like you. I want to I wanna hear you say, well done. I'm, I'm going to get rid of pride. Help me with my struggles. Help me with my sins. I don't want to do that anymore. Lord Jesus, help. He's going to do it. And for you, I declare that this is the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the Lord's favor over your life. This is the time of restoration. This is the time of God settling things that needs to be settled in Jesus. The fact that you stayed with me the whole hour and 15 minutes, I declare it to be so. God is going to demonstrate that you belong to him. And that he belongs to you. He's going to rise up and show you and those around you that he is the master and Lord over your life. Because you have stewarded well the things that he has given you. Including your body, your mind, your soul, your spirit. I know you're saying, but I'm 50 pounds overweight. That's okay. Make a decision today. I'm going to do better. I'm going to stop eating Twinkies. I'm going to stop eating Snickers. I'm going to walk a mile. Just make a decision. That's it. And be intentional. That's all he wants. That's all God wants for us to make a decision. And that decision is, I'm going to serve you. And how you serve him may not look like how I serve him. Amen. And guess what? That's okay.
Amen. God bless you. I love you with the love of the Lord. Again, I thank my pastor, our pastor, A. Thomas Hill of the Streams Church for allowing me to share with you today. Please join us at 630 every morning. I will put the uh, information regarding our prayer line on here. And then we're live at 715 every day on Facebook Live where pastor is doing a shirt, a, sorry, a short sermonette. Uh, to encourage you for the day. There's always a word for the week and he teaches on that word. And so I invite you to be a part of that. Uh, we are currently having worship service in our building, um, 38th and Lafayette Road. I can't, it just, I had it and it just left me. Uh, the Streams Church, uh, we are inside of New Wineskins uh, Church and we are in their chapel. So we do have worship service. Uh, currently at 1015, we use all protective measures. You have to have a mask. You get your temperature taken. We do social distancing. So there are so many ways and opportunities to connect with the Streams Church. So the prayer line, 630, um, here on Thursdays at 7, um, Facebook Live every day, 715, um, <coughs> worship service at uh, right now currently, uh, 1015 uh, in the worship service so in the building so amen i love you with the love of the lord thank you for joining me i appreciate you so much i pray that you receive something i will also put the um text link to give please consider giving to the streams church if this word blessed you if it's a word that you can take with you for the week and help you to be like oh wait a minute god said if i just do a few things and just try to do right and seek his face. And when I miss it, he's going to help me. And he said he's going to protect me from me, myself, and him. Oh, my. And others. Oh, my. He's a good God. He's a good God. And I'm not going to keep pimping the Lord. I'm going to do the right thing. And when I miss it, he's faithful and just to forgive me because he's a loving, loving God and Father. Amen. I love you with the love of the Lord. God bless you. I'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Joining me. Is it doing that? Oh. It's not letting me log off, but we're going to try this again. God bless. Amen.